The opinions and suggestions expressed in the following program are solely those of the participants and are not necessarily endorsed by KRMG, Cox Media Group Incorporated, or the program sponsors. This following program is sponsored by Causeway LLC. Information in this broadcast is not intended as an investment, tax, or financial advice. Matthew Moore is not a licensed investment advisor and speaks solely from his experience and opinions. All information in this broadcast is for entertainment or educational purposes only. Matthew Moore, Causeway LLC, and Cox Media Group Tulsa are not responsible for the success or failure of any person's investment decisions or purchases. Matthew Moore, Causeway LLC, and Cox Media Group Tulsa makes no and expressly disclaims all representations, warranties, and guarantees with respect to this broadcast and its sponsors. Investing in any market is inherently risky and can be financially dangerous. Invest at your own risk. Gather knowledge in the world of cryptocurrency right now on 1023 KRMG, Tulsa's news and talk. Welcome to Cryptocurrency with Matthew J. Moore. Matthew is locally based right here in Tulsa. Questions, comments, concerns? Call 918-460-5764 or send us an open mic using the KRMG app. Now, here's Cryptocurrency with Matthew J. Moore. Welcome to one of the only radio programs on the planet Earth to address this topic every week. We do it right here Sunday evenings five o'clock live and local on krmg it is cryptocurrency with matthew j moore thank you very much for joining us tonight i'm not gonna mess around we're gonna get right into it because we got a lot to cover this evening so let's introduce our host and the namesake of the show matthew j moore hey matt hey russell we are back the three people here in studio i don't think we've had it together for for a while a now while. So. Yeah, yes, it life is. gets in the way sometimes but, i know uh, the three amigos are back i know this this is great i, I want to welcome all of you bitcoin connoisseurs rick Ricky, a uh, rookie, I should say. Ricky, that's my one of my good friends there. Uh, <laughs> rookie hodlers, and yes, even those Bitcoin skeptics. This is America's one, probably one of the only radio shows dedicated to Bitcoin and the digital ecosystem itself, just like you heard Russell say. And if you haven't figured it out yet, Bitcoin is for the people, and that is why we do this show every Sunday at 5 p.m. It's our mission to get the masses thinking about these questions like, what is money and where is the future of money going? And if you're hungry to learn, or maybe you're just hungry in general, I mean, it is about dinner time. Chipotle might be the place to go. And this is not a, a paid or sponsored <laughs> ad here. But according to Coindesk.com, the fast casual mega chain, Chipotle Mexican Grill is now joining the ranks of other national chains, now accepting cryptocurrency as payment. And Chipotle is doing so through the Flexa digital payments platform. So the future, my friends, is not tomorrow. It's actually happening right now. And whether it's technology or monetary policy, changes are happening at record speeds. And that's why we bring you some of the top voices and thinkers in this space. And to help me explore this expansive universe is my co-host, co-pilot, non-biological brother, Eric Cooper. Eric, welcome back, my friend. Welcome back to the studio. So I, I don't think we'll do it this episode, but uh, I, I want to be Ned Niederlander if we're to do the Three Amigos. Um, <laughs> but uh, no, but so, Matt, uh, <laughs> Dusty Bottoms and a Lucky Day. I bet. Wow, I you think. know that movie. Way there, too we there we go. There we go. There we go. But yeah, today, speaking of going fast, we've got a real a legend joining us. His name's Guy Swan, and he's probably one of the um, people who's probably known and consumed the most content around Bitcoin. Um, he's probably read the most, and it's not an exaggeration. Uh, he is known as the Professor Bitcoin OG, and we'll dive into what the future holds and how Bitcoin's Lightning Network fits into that bigger picture. Mm -hmm. Yep, the verbal picture that guy is going to paint will have you sitting in mental awe. It will be a great conversation. I promise you that. But before we bring him on, Eric, can you do me a huge favor and introduce our sponsor for this segment? Absolutely. This segment's brought to you by a company called Hedge. Do you have a strategy to obtain cryptocurrency on a regular basis? Do you plan on automating your dollar cost averaging? What about getting all or even part of your paycheck in Bitcoin? Hedge is revolutionizing how you get paid. Hedge makes it easy to automatically convert your pay into crypto. Whether you're an employer or an employee, you can easily get started in four steps. Start getting paid in Bitcoin, Ethereum, or Litecoin. Crypto is a long-term play. Start a strategy today. Hedge is here to make it easy to stack them sats month after month. What are you waiting for? Start living on the hedge. Check them out at gethedge.io. Once again, that is gethedge.io. I O. Yes, and if you're ready to dive right in with Hedge, just let them know that I sent you. That'd be doing me a favor. And go to my website, mattjmore.com. And on the homepage, you can scroll down and find the button that says Get Hedge. You can start the sign-up process today. It's super easy. Okay, 
Everybody, I wish I had a school bell to ring. But, ding, ding, uh, ding, 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 ding. Right, there we go. Class is now in session. We're going to be talking about uh, one of the true and only cryptocurrencies that uh, you know could be classified as truly decentralized in many ways, and that's Bitcoin. You know, So I want you to take your seat, turn your attention to one of the best voices in Bitcoin. His name is Guy Swan. Guy is on the line with us. Uh, Guy, welcome to the show. Uh, word on the street is that you've actually read more about Bitcoin than any other person on earth how how is this so you can't deny fact you know it's, it's, it's built right into my podcast right so bitcoin audible um at just on the show i'm at what 630 reads i think like i, I basically scour the internet world for all of the best writing all the best ideas like just the coolest stuff the best research papers on bitcoin read them on the show and then commentate like that's that's how the whole idea came about um, I've got, uh, what, 11 audiobooks in the bag. Uh, there are three right now in the process of publishing, should be out in the next few weeks, give or take. And then another three in the process of being recorded. Um, and God, I can't even count the number of articles, audiobooks, books. I mean, just, I don't know, everything since, uh, you know, I got into, I had, I had a head, head start too. Like, I got into Bitcoin in late, late 2010. And immediately started read, reading everything I could get my hands on, and I have basically continued to do that ever since. So, guy, go into that a know, little bit more, kind of how you stumbled into Bitcoin just in general, because we're always a huge fan of the Genesis stories. Sure, sure. Um, so uh, I actually owe a lot of that to my brother because he was we were living together at the time, and he was taking economics in school. Um, and I was, I was doing film, but kind of like working my way back towards tech and, uh, just kind of internet protocols, like were interesting to me, like for instance, BitTorrent. Um, I'd always thought of like computers and tech and the internet as kind of like a game. Like that had always been my relationship with it. It was just cool, fun stuff. And I was kind of coming to a point where I was realizing that like the internet was really changing the world. Like it was fundamentally altering everything about how life worked and it was also altering politics like it was having a serious impact and i was starting to see it in a whole new light at the time um and BitTorrent had really shaken like century old in like massive industries were kind of brought to their knees and forced to alter how they interacted with their customer because of this little thing that this one piece of software that people had made and published on the internet and that was fascinating to me and my brother was taking economics, and his professor, he was literally arguing with his professors that, like, there was just nothing but contradiction in the Keynesian stuff he was being taught. Like, he would learn something in microeconomics that if you – like a rule, like, you know, you, you drop a hammer and a feather in zero gravity, and they fall at the same rate because gravity is consistent everywhere, right? Like, there's a rule. And then you'd go to macroeconomics, and they would literally teach you something that was the opposite of that rule. And he'd be like, "Like guys, these two things can't be the same, true at the same time. Like, it, you know, it's, it's either a principle or it's not. Like, the laws of the universe are not arbitrary. They're not up for debate, you know? Um, the, the idea is we discover what they are. Um, and so he started finding – we would go. He would come home, and we would um, argue basically about what he quote unquote learned, um, and then we would go through this process of unlearning it or trying to break through all the contradictions. And we found this Austrian economic theory, this this alternative school of economics um, that just made way way more sense. And when you kind of look at history and the Great Depression and even like most of the wars we've had through the through the frame of the Austrian economic theory, suddenly why these things happen makes so much more sense. And so we're going down this rabbit hole and out of nowhere, he's arguing with somebody on Facebook and the guy's like, you know, you'd probably be interested in this Bitcoin thing. And Bitcoin was essentially, it was, it was entirely built upon the Austrian economic theory. Like it's why there's 21 million and nothing else. Um, there are multiple fundamental Austrian truths to the Bitcoin network from an economic standpoint. It is a decentralized protocol that intends to free and a critical element of communication, money and trade from centralized entities. 
Like, so, so just like BitTorrent, it's literally the BitTorrent of money. So it was fascinating to me in that regard. And we were just like, it was just this trifecta of everything that we were fascinated with at the time. And we were just down the rabbit hole immediately. Um, it was, like I said, it was like late 2010 or early 2011. I can't remember exactly somewhere in that span. And uh, man, we were just, we were trapped immediately. Like I've, I'm, I mean, I'm still here. It's still all, it's all I do now. <laughs> <laughs> well, obviously you get paid to pretty much uh, read and uh, talk about Bitcoin, which is, which is pretty cool. And I, and I actually, when we come back from break, I, I'm actually really interested to know what the greatest revelation you've had with all of this reading. I mean, we hear the common ones, but mm-hmm. what about those ones that people don't really think about those kind of uh, roundabout or kind of weird thought process that uh, you kind of go down when you're in the world of Bitcoin, but we got to go to break here just shortly, but, uh, We have more from Professor Swan. And so on segment two, we'll dive into the weeds. Welcome back to Cryptocurrency with Matthew J. Moore. We are live and local in the big city of Tulsa on a Sunday evening. I'm Russell Mills. We do appreciate you hanging out with us tonight on one of America's only shows dedicated to this uh, high-tech high finance concept of cryptocurrency your host well he's from right here in tulsa too his name is matthew j moore hey matt hey russell that's right we keep this show local but we also have uh, listeners from all around the world and Since guests from and all guests. around the world i've been impressed by the some of the folks you've brought including mm-hmm. mr swan of i know i know we we try to make sure our our conversations are high caliber high quality and to help me do that is my co-host eric cooper eric yes ready matthew. for round two it's uh, it's good. We we got Guy Swan here with us, and um, this is episode forty nine. Next week, that makes it uh, fifty, if my math's correct. And uh, if you have missed any of our episodes, go back, check it out. You can check out on KRMG on demand. Uh, check us out on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, anywhere that you can do it. Google Play, etc. Right. Well, and you know, on the line with us, like Eric was saying, is none other than the Bitcoin professor himself, Guy Swan. Guy is probably the one person on this earth who has probably read the most about Bitcoin and has one of the most recognizable voices in the space due to his work at BitcoinAudible.com. And that's not an exaggeration. Uh, Welcome back, Professor Swan. Are you ready to uh, get uh, dirty in these Bitcoin weeds? Oh, hell yeah. Let's do it. (laughs) Let's do it. Let's make it a party. Well, man, uh, here's here's kind of what we wanted to talk about today. Um, obviously, Lightning Network is a huge deal for Bitcoin and for its adoption. Mm-hmm. Uh, we've all, you know, on this show, have talked about the certain evolution or stages of, of money and things becoming money, and you're probably very familiar with those concepts. But um, you obviously have some great knowledge in the Lightning Network. Can you explain to our listeners what Lightning is and why they should care? Yeah, sure. So... So Lightning Network, like I've done a number of like really in-depth technical breakdowns, but the simple way to think about what the Lightning Network is, is it's a a decentralized payment network built on top of Bitcoin. So I think it's really useful to think of Bitcoin as a secure system of ownership whose design, the way the protocol and the software works, is that there's simply no political or corporate leaders. Like it just exists. It's just there, and anyone can run it, and they run the whole thing when they boot up the software. So everyone is just playing it together because they all agree on the same rules. It's like the game of chess, right? Nobody owns chess. Nobody, there's not like a board of directors that get together every Wednesday, and they tell you what the new rules of chess are. People would stop playing chess if that was the case. And if they changed the rules, people would still just play chess as chess, and they'd be like, what's with these morons? who just keep changing the rules on this game that they pretend is chess. Um, That is what Bitcoin is. It's that for ownership and a monetary base. Lightning Network is a way to use that ownership. And because it's programmable, because it's a piece of software, you can give it instructions. And one of those sets of instructions, just like you know, on the web, you can create a website that doesn't do a whole lot, or you can create a website that design like social media and it has likes and it has shares and retweets and all of this stuff. Well, you can kind of do that same thing with the ownership of Bitcoin. And in doing so, you can create something called the Lightning Network that is a huge global instant settlement payment network that can scale to Visa size and beyond um, that is simply on top of Bitcoin. 
Guys, so I, I saw a tweet the other day, and just this is a little off the uh, script here, but I uh, I think it was Dan Held. He put on there, and you might have seen this one too, where he says, you know, someone just sent three hundred dollars, a million dollars worth of Bitcoin, and the transaction fees was like twelve cents, right? So and inst- instantly yeah. settled. So just crazy. But our listeners would probably be uh, interested in privacy. Does that increase the privacy um, w- when we do use the Lightning Network? Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Because you know, just in a kind of default sense in how it works is that the payment over lightning is ethereal like there's no like permanent record of it so while your ownership on bitcoin is critically dependent on the fact that the entire system can be audited and that and because of that every single transaction is published to the chain right it's published to the the uh the global network of bitcoin so everybody can see it now, that doesn't mean they know it belongs to you um, because there is a lot of uh, there is a lot of actual pseudonymity and benefits to privacy just from using Bitcoin. But when every single transaction is one step away from some KYC exchange at Coinbase where you gave your social security number and you filled out your address and everything, it's not hard to make a lot of connections. If we had a big if we already had a uh robust and broad network of people just exchanging between them, um, like a circular economy, uh, which I think we is growing very, very quickly now, that privacy, the, the natural privacy of Bitcoin would be a lot better. Now, Lightning Network, as a layer on top of it, doesn't even store these transactions. You're able to make, you know, thousands, maybe even hundreds of thousands of transactions off the chain. And what you do is you essentially settle the final ownership you, you aggregate all of these transactions together and say, what's the net positive or negative to this address I used to own? And then you can settle that on the main chain. So in that sense, Bitcoin kind of acts like this decentralized court for the decentralized payment network of Lightning uh, so that everything can happen with a lot of versatility like Visa, a lot of programmability like a website, but still the robust security and ownership of something like Bitcoin. You know, those those are all fantastic points, and uh, I guess I guess my question, uh, my question or follow up question is this: um, Do you have any concerns with with Lightning Network or Layer Two solutions? Because I mean, obviously, there's lots of critics out there, and they have objections to to the Lightning Network. Uh, but but what would you say to those who might be worried or or have concerns? I would say, in comparison to what, uh, you know, like you know, you, you hear uh, you go ahead. Sorry. Well, I'm just like, usually that comparison is made is that like, oh, well, lightning isn't perfect. It's like, well, of course it isn't. Like the internet, like all of the protocols and the stacks, the layers on top of the internet are anything but perfect. They're riddled with limitations or ways that we have to work around or we'll need an entirely new protocol just to get around with one of the limitations of the previous protocol in the stack, right? Um, But it still ended up being the best thing the best job to do the, to make a decentralized network most robust and reliable on a global level. Um, but if you had to redesign the internet, you could, could you could say that oh we should have prioritized it for this that or the other. But one of the beautiful things about why the internet worked and not all of the proprietary protocols that competed with the internet during its early days was that it wasn't optimized for anything in particular. It chose to just do a few things incredibly well and incredibly reliably. Now, the Lightning Network is not perfect. There's tons of problems to still sort out, and it's it's amazing what we've been able to do so far. And I think its future is really kind of beautiful with where we are in its its, uh, evolution, I guess, so to speak, right now. Um, But certainly, you know, it's not it's not as if we've already accomplished infinite scaling and there's nothing there's no work left to be done. It's not as if uh, there's not a trade-off with, uh, you know, having to watch the network live on Lightning, whereas Bitcoin, you don't have to watch the network just to know you own Bitcoin. As soon as you get a transaction, it's done. It's settled. Lightning Network is something where it's like kind of a live contract. You want to be there and make sure that nobody's trying to cheat you out of what you own. Um, and so there's a little bit of a trade-off. You get all these benefits. You get this versatility. You get this programmability and instant transaction. But you have to be there. You have to be connected to the Internet to make sure that, you know, you're safe, so to speak. Um, But uh, 
it's amazing the amount of things we've already figured out just in the last like two or three years and essentially the upgrades, the improvements coming down the line that are going to solve so many of the major problems of the Lightning Network. I think it's just like, you know, in the early days of the Internet, connecting a modem was a nightmare. All you know, right. You had, to, you had to do this over the phone line and – well, we got it. We got to go to break here real quick. No, 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 it's okay. Uh, but when we come back, we've got more ground to cover with the Bitcoin professor, Guy Swan. So stick around. And I will tell you, I remember modem squawk all too well. <laughs> um, the first modem I saw was a box. You picked up a phone, you dialed it with a dial, and you set the handset, handset down on the top on. of the box. Me too. Yep, I'm that old, and I'm not that old. Just saying. All right. Quick time out for the news and weather. You're listening to 1023 KRMG Tulsa's News and Talk. More cryptocurrency with Matthew J. Moore straight ahead. Oh, welcome back to Cryptocurrency with Matthew J. Moore. My name is Russell Mills, and we are live on a Sunday evening here in the big city of Tulsa. Our special guest today, Guy Swan. If you're interested in reading more about Guy or checking out his podcast and stuff, the website is Guy Swan, and that's spelled with two N's, G-U-Y-S-W-A-N-N dot com. Now let's turn it over to our guy, the man, the myth, the legend, and the host of this show, Matthew J. Moore. Hey, Matt. That's right. We're tunneling through the dark weeds of this massive space. And if you're seeing that orange light, that's right. That's Bitcoin. And you're here at the right spot, the radio show that's dedicated to this subject. And uh, to help me navigate through these weeds is my co-host, Eric Cooper. I love it. Love it, man. Good to be back. Uh, gone for two weeks, so that's uh, always good. No, never again. But uh, if you've <laughs> missed the last few segments, we've been chatting with Guy Swan from GuySwan.com and BitcoinAudible.com. Guy, if you're ready to roll, let's get the session going again. Let's kick it off with this. For our listeners, um, can you explain the slogan, you know, you fix the money, fix the world? Is this referring to the time perversion uh, easy money creates, uh, you know, ultimately encouraging more shortcuts, cheats, and corruption? Yeah, without a doubt. Um, I think there's a pretty deep ignorance that the average person, for good reason, that the average person has over how critical money is in society. You know, money is half of every single transaction ever. And if you begin to, if you perverse that transaction, if you push that transaction in one way or another, there's so many poisonous things that you can create in society, so, many, so much rotting of the culture that, that drives away from real value by essentially manipulating the money. You can, by breaking the money, you can break the world. And if you fix the money, if you make the money free from corruption, you make it so that literally the money cannot be corrupted by the design of it. You solve all of those systemic problems, and I think people just fail to realize that the skyrocketing cost of health care, the, the incredible skyrocketing cost of housing, of the stock market, the bloating financial system, and the constant gambling, and the unicorn billionaire companies that literally have never turned a profit, like this incredibly, obviously – unfair, but so few people can articulate why exactly it's unfair system is in, deeply embedded with simply how our money works. Um, and if you fix that, you fix all of it. So recently on Twitter, you, you made comment or, or you posted that uh, the centralized DeFi is the Trojan horse into the ecosystem that will reintroduce control, surveillance, and trust. Can you explain this? Is this like the number one threat to Bitcoin? You could say that maybe. Um, I don't think it's a huge threat to Bitcoin. I think it's a huge threat to the people who use it. Um, and I think it's mostly because DeFi is really the facade. The D part of it is a facade, like it's fake. Um, there are explicit companies and explicit huge servers that are running most of the, like they're literally like two essentially providers that actually run the the main the full quote unquote ethereum nodes um and if the government came to them and said this is what you need to do your, to change the code um it would be far far easier to the the vast number of 
quote unquote tokens and protocols and stuff in the DeFi ecosystem uh, than it would be in Bitcoin. Um, and they would actually change. I mean, there's even quote unquote DeFi protocols right now talking about implementing KYC, which is the exact, it's proof that they're not decentralized. If you can't run it without them, if the system's going to fall apart and they want to implement KYC because they want to appease, you know, some jurisdiction, well, then it's, it's simply just centralized finance as it always is. It's just written in a different type of software. Right. And the, for those who don't get it, uh, and the, the irony in this phrase here, centralized DeFi, if, if you don't know what that means, DeFi is supposed to stand for decentralized <laughs> finance. <laughs> yeah. Um, in, the, in the KYC. Centralized decentralized finance. <laughs> right, right. In the KYC, we, we say that quite often. It's know your clients. Uh, so obviously we want to put in all your uh, your your sensitive information so we know who is buying where. Um, so we, we, we are in this exclusive club. It's still early. We have so such small adoption, you know, does, does Bitcoin lose any of its positive attributes with mass adoption? And, uh, you know, is you think there's anything that Bitcoiners should do moving forward to uh, protect the integrity of Bitcoin? I think the beauty of Bitcoin is that you protect Bitcoin by protecting your own integrity, your own sovereignty, like run a Bitcoin node, right? Yeah. Run a lightning node. If you want to be a part of the lightning network and, the, you know, payment protocol and everything. Um, and, it's, so in that sense, it's kind of self-healing. Like when you have a, if we get to a point where everybody's exchanging paper Bitcoin, well, then you, because Bitcoin can be so easily withdrawn from exchanges, you run into a situation where paper Bitcoin may diverge in price from real Bitcoin. Mm. And in that sense, you would have a bank run and things would heal. Um, that's essentially what happened with Mt. Gox, right? The, one of the most famous blow-ups was essentially a giant fractional reserve on a single exchange that everyone was dependent on, and the thing collapsed like six months after it went seriously fractional reserve. Whereas fiat, because it's fractional, because it's backed by nothing by its nature, we've had this horrible fractional reserve imbalance that has continued and worsened for literally like 70 years to the point that it's like. We're somewhere between 100 and $200 trillion in liabilities that is never going to be paid. And the only thing that can possibly crack to fix that imbalance is the money itself. Bitcoin can't do that. Our fractional reserve problems last as long as Mt. Gox lasted, right? So as time goes on, people just need to run nodes. People just need to withdraw, hold their own keys, and learn the tools, and Bitcoin will heal itself. Obviously, there will be two steps forward, one step back. There will be pain points. There will be problems. There will be blown up exchanges through, you know, Bitcoin's future. So, Guy, I, I hear from critics often, and you might dismiss this and uh, or put people, people at ease with this, but uh, or maybe I'm wrong. Uh, Guy, I, you know, here's here's mm -hmm. the question. Um People often say, you know, Bitcoin might be great for freedom, but what happens if governments control internet access of the everyday person? Do you see this as a possible problem? Why or why not? Um, well, the control of the internet is always a problem. Uh, but the one of the amazing things about Bitcoin and the adversarial engineering that has created the system is explicitly around the idea that it can't be reliant on the main problems of the internet in order to survive. Um, the, the design of it recognizes that the internet can be controlled um, in certain ways and that it's hard to uh, get incredibly high amounts of bandwidth secretly, so to speak, or, or sovereignly. Like So a great example is actually the Great Firewall of China, is China has an incredibly robust national firewall. If they shut it down and they said, we refuse to let any cryptocurrency in and out of the country, then most, almost all of the cryptocurrency networks would bifurcate and you'd have Ethereum China and Ethereum not China. Like you'd have completely different networks because there's so much bandwidth to run the system that you wouldn't be able to get it over Tor. You wouldn't be able to make it work over an alternative network. Bitcoin, on the other hand, is explicitly designed to be incredibly light at the ownership layer specifically for this security problem so that you can run a Bitcoin node over a satellite connection. You can run it and there are people running. There is a satellite network that is running entirely over satellite and 
uh, running over old broadband TV stations. You can do the same thing on low bandwidth um, uh, radio. You can uh, run it entirely over Tor. All of my nodes actually run over Tor. So even that bottleneck will allow us to get across the Great Firewall of China. Bitcoin would not bifurcate. It would stay one network, one global system, and at most you just have a slightly higher lag from being in China versus outside. So I don't know if you saw Jack Maller's uh, you know keynote when at uh, Bitcoin in Miami, and he was talking about how innovation when it comes to money, nothing has happened since the '40s, since like the Dadgum Diners Club card, right? So do you do, do, <laughs> yeah, what is, do you have anything on the tip of your tongue? Like what is the next level for 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 Lightning? What is the next level for us just in taking care of the money, taking care of Bitcoin? What do you? What, I mean, what's your thoughts around that? So I think probably the next step here, like the phase that we're moving into lightning is the medium of exchange phase. Um, I think with what we're seeing with El Salvador, with Panama, with these handful of countries that are beginning to embrace this as a technology, but more importantly, we're seeing companies like NIDIG that is actually working with Stripe on board infrastructure back end. So there's something amazing that happened when the communications networks went from analog and centralized and owns like the AT&T network to the internet, which kind of flipped that relationship on its head, right? It used to be permissioned. If I wanted to implement something on the AT&T network like a feature, there was no way to do it without contacting AT&T. The internet flipped that entirely on its head. Now a 14 year old kid who knows some lines of Python can create a social media that destroys a hundred year old industry in his garage in his spare time. That is what's happening to money right now with Bitcoin. And we are entering the phase where I think we're going to start seeing, we're already seeing billions of dollars. I think we're going to move into the hundreds of billions and the trillions of dollars independently on this open source network settled globally in transfers between any country in the world because there are no borders. Mm. There's no borders on Lightning. There's no borders on Bitcoin. Um, and I think we're watching just like the AT&T infrastructure switched over to the internet quietly in the background. And uh, and then we moved into the consumer phase. I think we're seeing the same thing with Bitcoin and Lightning. The infrastructure is going to be pulled out from underneath them. We will not use Swift. We will necessarily use an open, open source and permissionless system because it just works better and it's a standard. And awesome. we're going to start seeing massive amounts of capital, fiat capital, move quickly, instantly, and for free because – it runs on Bitcoin. Right. Well, guys, this, this has been a great, great conversation, and we're going to go to break here. But when we come back, we're going to have just some final thoughts and questions for Guy. So stick around. Once again, if you're interested in reading more about Guy, you can find his website at GuySwan, G-U-I-S-W-A-N-N dot com. We'll be back with more cryptocurrency with Matthew J. Moore after a quick timeout. You're listening to 1023 KRMG, Tulsa's News and Talk. Welcome back to Cryptocurrency with Matthew J. Moore. We are live and local in Tulsa, Oklahoma on a Sunday evening. My name is Russell Mills. would like to thank you for taking the time to listen to one of America's only, oh heck, the world's only full-time radio broadcasts on this topic. Cryptocurrencies, NFTs, blockchain technology, we cover it all here on the old KMR. And we do it with the help of our host, Matthew J. Moore. Hey, Matt. Oh, that's right. Uh, we're here. I'm, I was spinning in my chair. This whole this whole show keeps my head spinning. But you know what? We're here. We're here to unpack it. We're here to have great conversations, and that's why we bring on our phenomenal guests who have a little bit to say. They they know a thing or two, right? And to help me uh, undo or, or go through all of that, unpack that, you know, open up that present, right? Of what is all this about? Is my uh, co-host and uh, my good friend Eric Cooper. He's gonna he's gonna carry on the conversation with us. It's a great great bit of knowledge, and uh, like anything, we encourage you to listen to our show. We're uh, next week's 50 episodes uh but uh i encourage you to do like our guest today uh, consume content and, and educate yourself as much as possible because again you can listen to us and just believe us and say right on captain or go in and uh, learn more because you know what we might have you on as a uh, guest <laughs> guest host right well you know this this show is only made possible by our wonderful sponsors and today this segment the final segment is brought to you by our newest and local sponsor spring is in the air and in oklahoma that means tornadoes and nasty pollen all over the place 
You know, there's nothing we can do about those tornadoes. We hope you stay safe. But we can definitely help you with that uh, yellow pollen-tinted car. Yes, that's right. It becomes so prevalent this mm-hmm. year. That's why this segment is brought to you by Bubble Up Car Wash and Broken Arrow off of 470 East Kenosha Street. They are Broken Arrow's newest locally owned car wash with all the bells and whistles. To make your car clean, shiny, and dry, come take advantage of their free vacuums, air wands, and towels. They have unlimited wash plans starting at $19.99 a month, and you can add a family member for just $15 a month per vehicle. Not a bad deal. So what are you waiting for? Go cheer up at Bubble Up, and who knows? You might catch a glimpse of their uh, family dog, Bentley, the Bubble Up Pup. You can check them out at uh, www dot my bubble up dot com and uh if you uh haven't been around for the whole show today we've had a wonderful visit with uh guy swan who honestly could probably be one person noted to have read the most about bitcoin than any other person on this earth that might sound like an exaggeration but uh, it's probably not because this guy's done a lot of reading with uh, bitcoin audible uh but before we close out the show we have a few more questions for him uh guy uh let's start it here where where is your focus right now in this space and 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 why so uh, it's absolutely lightning, um, lightning, and uh, some much-needed privacy improvements that are uh, basically in development right now. Um, but I think really the heart of where things are moving right now is the the layer on top of Bitcoin is is the Lightning Network. Um, I use it literally every day, um, and some of the new tools are just fascinating. I'm setting up like a third node right now to experiment with some stuff. Uh, and a couple of things I'm privy to uh, with some of the developers that I chat with, man, there's just, there's some really exciting crap coming. That's, I mean, that's obviously, uh, we're talking about innovation. Lightning is, uh, is leading the charge. Uh, what do you think for the next 12 months? Like, what, what do you think that uh, the world has to uh, open their eyes and take a look at for uh, in the crypto sphere? So I think one of the big things, like going back to the analogy I used about AT&T and the birth of the Internet, when we moved from the centralized owned telephone networks to the open and permissionless Internet networks uh, in this country. One thing that happened, you remember, you remember long distance fees, right? Oh, yeah. You remember when you'd call across the country and there'd be this awful hiss on the line because it's this analog network. Well, there was this whole period where everybody still had analog phones, but the back-end infrastructure was switching to packet switching, was switching to internet protocols. Um, so the the network itself was changing, but the end of the line, the last step, your grandma was still picking up her corded phone in the kitchen to call some to call her friend across the country. But the long distance fees went away, the delay went away, the um, the hiss on the line started to go away and this happened over about like four or five years that's where i think we are with bitcoin is the liquidity on the network is so great now and it's exposed to mark it has its own market in so many different countries basically every country in the world um for the most part um and the lightning network has grown so much and it's finally basically in infrastructure operational order and is being used for exactly that purpose uh, I think we're going to start to see the three day, three business days to send money over ACH, the the wait a week to send it to another country, the exorbitant fees, the average 10% fees um, from the South American and African continent to um, to move any sort of money, uh, the fact that smaller payments cost more than larger payments. I think all of that is going to slowly fall away. Um, mm. A lot of people aren't going to know why. It's just going to start happening, but it's because of the banking system. It's because the new service that they're using is using Bitcoin and Lightning on the back end. I think this this year and next year are really going to be the heart of that transition. That's so. Those are all really, really good points. And you know, we we saw uh, even transitions in the way people are thinking about it. Even institutions like the uh, uh, you know antagonist uh, J.P. Morgan. Uh, you know, he, he basically Jamie Jamie Dimon had made many comments many years ago, especially in 2017, 2018, that uh, you know Bitcoin was. Um, was just this giant, you know, giant, I don't know, scam. I'm, I'm putting it into a, you know, yeah. I'm abbreviating here. I don't know his exact words, but it was definitely. You never ne- use it. They it would yeah. never, J.P. Morgan would never invest in it. <laughs> right, exactly. And then you've got, you know, just recently they just came out and that Bitcoin is their preferred alternative asset now. 
So, wow, yeah. you know, like the the mentalities, the uh, the ideas around the space, you know, are changing. And so, uh, you know, Guy, we got one minute left, but I just want to let you know, I want people to know, where can they find you and follow your work? Uh, yeah, yeah, you can find me on Twitter. I post all sorts of craziness, um, being a, uh, an anarchist Bitcoiner. <laughs> um, but you can find me at the Guy Swan. Uh, Swan is spelled with two N's, by the way. It's the last name, not the bird. Um, and then, of course, the Bitcoin Audible podcast. I announce anything, any of the video work or the stuff that I'm doing. Uh, you'll get it through the podcast. But if you want to learn literally anything about Bitcoin, the economics, the philosophy, the cypherpunk history, the like, the cryptography that birthed the 40-year prehistory of Bitcoin, I mean, all of it, literally, top to bottom, you don't you don't miss much in 630 reads and I still do episodes three times a week. I love it. Well, guys, this has been a wonderful show. I hope you will join us next Sunday at five o'clock with more great content on this subject. Absolutely. And if you'd like to see Matt's website, a reminder, you'll find him at Matt J Moore, two T's and Matt, two O's and more Matt J Moore.com. And there you'll see links where you can learn about get hedge. You can learn about past episodes. It's all there for you. And we will definitely be back here live and local in the big city of Tulsa next Sunday at five cryptocurrency with Matthew J Moore on 1023 KRMG. I'm Russell Mills. See you then.